And that means I can stand here. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the final Spartan Lunchtime Lecture of the season. It's very supposed to express some kind of disappointment. Thank you. We've got a very appropriate talk today because exactly 112 years ago to the day, uh, Bradford City were about to play Newcastle United in the FA Cup final at the Crystal Palace. Uh, apparently there were thousands of people outside the Bradford Daily Telegraph office, uh, which, which is now on the opposite um, Centenary Square, and they were waiting for the Telegraph news. It had the score, nil-nil up, and it said nil-nil ran for the game. Apparently some lunatic in the second half shouted, City scored! And everybody went berserk, and we all know that person, don't we? And um, anyway... They didn't score, and of course it went to a replay on the Wednesday, which will be obviously the next Wednesday when the City won at, um, at Old Trafford. Um, what an only victory, I would have thought it. I bet the people at the time thought, oh, well, next year we'll be back in the Cup Final again. Anyway, essentially we have played in three Cup Finals, haven't we? I suppose we've the FA Cup Final replay than the League Cup Final. So, but anyway, I ramble on too much. Uh, so we've got John Kennedy today, who's going to talk about his grandfather. Is it grandfather or great-grandfather? I'll explain. He'll explain who was the chairman of Bradford City when they won the FA Cup exactly, not exactly, almost exactly 112 years ago today. So don't forget to do with Pastor John. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very conscious that when I was looking at other speakers of this, they were, they were all doctor this and doctor that. I'm not. Uh, I'm not an academic. I'm not an expert on Bradford. And I'm not an expert on Bradford City. But all my family came from Bradford. And I'm going to use that as a kind of pretext for, for, the, dis, for, for the discussion. Um, and it's the stories of Paddy's Krauts and Tykes and the makeup of Bradford and, 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 and the, the connection, little connection with the team. That little picture there, which I'll go into a bit more detail later, is a, obviously uh, the new, shiny, brand new FA Cup and a, a Newcastle United player and a, a Bradford City player. But you'll see more of that as time goes through. And this is the story in the time, at the, at the early part of the 20th century, when Bradford had gone from 15,000 people in 1800 to a quarter of a million people in 1900, and kind of a bit of an idea of who those people were and where, where they came from. Could you move us on, Mike? <clears throat> so this is... My family tree, that's me there. Then there's my mum and dad, who were both born and brought up in Bradford. My dad went to Beeds, my mother went to St Joseph's. And their parents above, they were also all born and bred in Bradford. Most of them around 1900 to 1910. But my granddad, Lawrence, was born in 1901, and he remembers Bradford City winning the FA Cup. He's dead now, so he can't come and talk to us, but he remembers it. But the ones above, who are the ones I'm going to talk a little bit about, they came from all over the place and, and are quite a reflection of the makeup of Bradford in that early 20th century. Um, uh, the Reverend James Glynd in 1835 said, The natives of Scotland are here, the natives of Ireland are here. From the pleasant vales of Devonshire, men and women have come. From the banks of the Rhine and the Elbe, they are coming. So that was in 1835 as Bradford changed. Could we move on a bit? <clears throat> so, this is Wilhelm Norbert Pollock. Um, my cousin, who suggested that I come and do this talk, is a barrister. So he's used to slightly stretching the evidence base <laughs> <laughs> to make it fit a case. So um, I am not Norbert's, Norbert's grandson. Um, he was born in 1868, and he died in 1916. It would be a bit of a stretch, because I'm only 37, of course, <laughs> for him to be my grandfather. However, I will explain that um, he came from Württemberg. He came from right down in the south of Germany, right near the, the Czech border. Um, he was a yarn merchant, and he was a Roman Catholic, and that's a bit of an interesting thing, because we're... We'll move a touch a bit on that. Um, because, and he was part of that really important German contingency in Bradford that came from the 1830s onwards 
and were the wool merchants of the city. And I'll talk a little bit about them a bit later, a bit later on. But just to get the facts absolutely right, because we will go into a couple of cul de sacs on, as, as we speak. So, sorry, Mike, could you just go back to? I want you to keep your eye on here. So that's my grandma. And that's her sister, Auntie Teresa, who I knew very, very well. And she was married to a gentleman called Frederick Leo Pollock. And Leo Pollock's dad was Wilhelm Norman Pollock. So I am related by marriage to Wilhelm. He's not actually a granddad. Could we move on? So there he is there, William Pollock, 1868 to 1916, and his parents, Joseph and Pauline, who were from Woodburg. Can we move on? So, I'm gonna take you through my great-grandparents, give you a little bit of idea about their life, where they come from, what they did, that sort of thing. And we will get to something about Bradford City. It is there, it is there. <coughs> So, the, the guy who I bear the name of, Stephen Kennedy, is the only one of them that was born in Bradford, because he was a very early Irish migrant. His father was a chap called Robert. He came to Leeds in 1841. He's on the 1841 census in a boarding house in Leeds, and he's a stuffed warehouseman, and he was 20 years old. And he came from a little bit of uh, Sligo called Tyrira. Um, and at that time, in the 1840s, there'd been a drop in the linen trade, and he was a linen weaver from Sligo. They were quite, and quite a few of them from that area, and for Manor and Mill, moved to Bradford and Dundee, I think, because they had textile skills. And they came over here to work in the growing textile market. And um, Stephen was also a stuff merchant, or a, a, a travelling, commercial traveller in stuff, as they say. Um, I don't think he was very good at it. I do remember my granddad saying occasionally tea was cardboard. Um, so I think he went ups and downs. There were times that were good and the times that were not very good. Um, but he wasn't a particularly good businessman. His wife is Clara Cecilia Ford. Her family came from, also came from Sligo. Um, they were both Irish, and what was interesting in, in, in looking at the Irish ancestors, some of them were terribly proud of being Irish and, and would live it, and you'll see one guy in a minute. But others wanted to get rid of it as soon as they possibly could. Apparently Clara was in that vein. Um, I, I suppose today we'd call her a bit of a snob, I'm not really sure. But she had quite an interesting background. Her dad, and we don't talk about this in the family too much, but her dad was in the sorry, her granddad was in the Royal Irish Constabulary in Sligo. He was actually born in Cork. But if you joined the RIC then, you didn't get posted in your own neighbourhood. You wouldn't live long. So they moved you to the other side of the country, and he was an RIC man. Unfortunately, he uh, was caught drunk on duty three times and was sacked. So he moved over to Uddersfield and joined the West Yorkshire Police. Lasted about five years and got sacked <laughs> for being caught drunk on duty three times. So she was posh, but she did, she, she had uh, skeletons in her closet. Um, could we move? So this guy I think you'll find quite interesting. This is Henry Benson. And Henry Benson was a bit of a character and a half. He had a terrazzo flooring company, and I've got one of his bills here. And his, his workhorse was, uh, work, was on Church Street, just near St Mary's Church. Um, but he was also a publican, uh, an activist, a gun runner, and football coach. So we'll have a look at that in a minute. Um, he, he was the publican of two pubs. He, he, he had the, the Turk's Head in Birkland Street which is off Leeds Road. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, does it? Huh? I don't know if it, it But he, he, he was also the landlord of the new Beehive for several years as well, which is just round the corner from here. His wife, Bridget Glynn, who was from County Clare, they met in Bradford, 
but they were from different, he was from Roscommon, she was from Clare. That's a picture of her with her very fearsome looking nun aunt. <laughs> Sister Veronica, I believe she was called. What a get up that they were. So Bridget, Bridget died young, only 49. Um, um, but Henry lived quite a good and long life. Can you move us on? This is where Henry was born. This is a little house in Roscommon. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is in the 1930s. The, the, the two kids on the right are uh, my auntie Kathleen and Bernard Benson, who were Henry's son and daughter, and their cousin Margaret. That was in about 1930 when they were about 16. Um, uh, in our family, none of us can play any instruments. Uh, none of us are very good at sport. So they're obviously just pretending. They couldn't actually play any. <clears throat> Could you move us on? Uh, there were, this is that house, that exact same house today, with a, now with a proper roof on and a bit, and that is the fireplace that he would have sat around cooking his Irish stew over a turf fire, and um, we still visit. It was, it's a very poor area of land, really poor pod land. They lived as tenants, um, where they were just, uh, one year at a time, their, their lease was done, and their landlady was a lady called Fanny Malloy, who lived in Coot Hall down the road, who, who had about 8,000 acres and was an Anglo-Irish family. Could you move us on? Uh, sorry, just a little quick thing on that last family bit. He had eight siblings and a classic Irish thing. One became a priest, one became a nun, three went to America, one came to Bradford, and two of the sisters married local farmers. And one got the house. Yeah, because you couldn't live, only one family could live on the house. So, and, and apparently what Henry said, people said, why did you come to Bradford? And he said, well, I got off the boat on Liverpool, and the furthest I could get was the money in my pocket to Bradford. <laughs> so I ended up in Bradford. I don't know how true that is. But Henry was a bit of an activist as well. He was the northern president of the Irish Self-Determination League in the 19, late teens and 20s. And he... Um, I'll do a little bit about him, but he... he there was the Irish Race Congress, which is this thing, which was uh, planned in, in 1920 and 1921. And it took place in January 22. The treaty was signed between the British and the Irish for the partition of Ireland in the, in the autumn, I think it was the December of, of 21. And this conference had been previously planned, happened in Versailles in, in Paris, and it was to bring the Irish diaspora together to put pressure on the British government during that war of independence and the fighting that was happening in Ireland. By the time it took place, the treaty had been signed, so this was a very divided meeting. You know, there, there were people divided between being treatists who agreed with it and, and anti-treatists who wouldn't. And it was just about the commencement of the Irish Civil War between the new state of Ireland army and the IRA. Henry is up there. That's Eamon Dubalera, the first president of Ireland. That's Countess Markovitz. And they had three days of lectures. W.B. Yeats was there. And they talked about what was the economy, what was agriculture, what was the foreign policy of Ireland going to be as an independent country. Now, Henry also did other things. <clears throat> so I've got here, um, he used to collect in his pubs. So these are receipts from the Provisional Irish Parliament which was declared at the Easter Rising in 1916. And uh, in 1920, he was collecting sums of uh, 100 pounds, 125 pounds, quite a lot of money in those days, and sending them to the Provisional Doyle. And they sent him receipts, you know, properly signed receipts for it. But another thing about him that you might be interested in, uh, in the 50s, the Irish realized that it, they had to start writing their own history because there wasn't anybody to write it for them anymore. So they did a, a big thing of witness statements where they interviewed people who take part in the War of Independence and take part in the Civil War to get it down on record. And um, it was all under the, the view that nothing would be published until the individuals were dead. But in that um, witness statement, there's a Richard Walsh, who was a, who was a senior officer in the County Mayo IRA at the time, and this is in uh, about 1919 or 1920. And his statement, he said, the next place I went to was Sheffield, and from there to Bradford. I made contact with a man named Benson, who was most, most useful to me in procuring arms. 
When I got the stuff, I was faced with the difficulty of obtaining a safe place for storing it when Benson introduced me to the principal of the Christian Brothers School in Bradford, who helped me to take, this, uh, take charge of my stuff. This school later became one of the principal dumps for munitions in this part of England. Benson also put me in touch uh, in Leeds with a man named McNamara, uh, who, prepared, who procured arms for me and also stored them. Now, the, the story goes, apparently, that the Christian Brothers School was behind St Mary's Church, on church where he had his office. And the priest at the time was a German, apparently. Um, but the housekeeper was only about four foot. So they, they hid all the arms in the loft, and they'd open the loft space, and they'd chuck her up, and then pass up the weapons to her, and then she'd jump down and get caught. So he was a, apparently he stopped doing it when the British brought in the death penalty for assisting an arms dealing. He decided he had kids and a business and things, and he would, he would move into still collecting, but he wasn't going to do any more arms dealing. <clears throat> so. So, here we go. Big round of applause. We're going to have some football. Hey. Hey. So there's, there's Henry again. And I think this picture is taken outside the, um, the Turk's head. Because if you look at the guy at the back, in the left, above his head, that sort of classic kind of pub tiling, and the sign behind in tiles says fine ales. So I'm presuming that's the, tur the Turk's head thing. And it's St. Peter's. Uh, the, just off, I think St. Peter's is a church there on Leeds Road. Um, it's St. Peter's. They've obviously won something in the 1922-23 season, because all the medals are there. I'm pretty sure it's a football team, but there might be an outside chance, but I've not been able to find anything. It's a GAA team, it's a girl football team, because there was a very big Irish contingent, uh, you know, 10, 20% of the population was Irish, um, and GAA stuff was a very big part of the identity of the nationalist movement, so it could have been. If anybody knows anything about that, then I'd love to hear. So we've had some football. You're a now this is a bit of a cul-de-sac, but I couldn't really mention Henry without talking about his son Bernard very, very quickly. Bernard Benson was a priest. He was a, a curate in Sheffield. He was born and brought up in Bradford. But he volunteered in the Second World War to be a chaplain, an army chaplain. And he was in the parachute regiment. Oh, it's that thing coming up. And he was in the parachute regiment. And he went into Arnhem in a glider in Operation Market Garden. Um, and there's, there's quite a few bits written about him in, in the various uh, documentaries of that, but uh, he, was, he was clearly, uh, they were being fired at by a very short range artillery piece from the Germans. And he, he went upstairs to see if there was any patients still upstairs in the field hospital that they were, they were manning. And he got his arm blown off and his foot mangled and his face and they, he, he, they brought him downstairs, and the room kept changing sides between Germans and, and British. Um, and they had to amputate his arm from just below the elbow, and they didn't have the right kit, so they used a, um, a file that was in the escape kits and a bit of wire to cut his arm off. Um, he was distressed. Uh, for any of you Catholics, you'll know the phrase, please take this sacrifice from my hands in the Mass. The priest says, take this sacrifice from my hands. And he thought with the loss of his arm, he wouldn't be able to do what was his life, which was saying mass. Because the Catholic Church wasn't very kindly in those days, and the disabled priests were sometimes barred from, uh, from because they, they weren't kind of whole um, to, to be able to do it. So he's buried in, in, in Arnhem, um, and uh, it, interestingly, he also wrote a letter, considering his father was gun running for the IRA only a couple of decades before. He joined the British Army and actually wrote to the uh, government to say, why don't we have an Irish battalion? And they wrote back saying, a bit tricky at this time. <laughs> <laughs> but, but he, he and he, he was apparently a, a very jolly chap and um, he uh, helped with the morale, but sadly, sadly he died. Now, this is the German bit. Yeah. So this is Robert Johannes Kretschmar, who was my great granddad. He was from the opposite side of Germany to Norbert. He was from way over near the Czech border, 
in a little place called Dulbeln in, uh, in Leipzig, he, he came from. And he, he did have a very interesting um, story, which I'll go through in a moment. His wife, his second wife, Sarah Mortimer, uh, she was from North Yorkshire. Her, her, her family were farm labourers from North Yorkshire, and, and she moved into Bradford and uh, married Robert. He's a contemporary of Norbert. He was two years older than Norbert. Absolutely, they would have known each other. Um, whether they liked each other or not, he was a Lutheran. Uh, Norbert was a Catholic. Norbert was apparently a very kind, kindly and slightly nervous man. He was an absolute, you know, cart horse. You know, he, he you know, thick-skinned, um, but a very interesting character. He came to Britain. Well, he. He, he, he was born in Leipzig and he then went, did his national service, did an apprenticeship in the wool trade and then he was sent to Bradford. Came to Bradford, went back to Germany and a week later came back to Bradford and never went back again. Um, and immediately he arrived here, he wrote to, to Berlin and said I want to rescind my German nationality. And they wrote back and said you can't because you're not German, you're a Saxon. <laughs> right to Leipzig. So he wrote to Leipzig and he got discharged from citizenship. But he didn't become naturalized until nearly 10 years later. I don't know why, so for about 10 years in the 1890s, he was stateless. Um, when he moved, moved, he moved to uh, Howard Street, for Howard Street, where he lodged with a Mrs. Bentham, a, a, a widow, widow. And then a couple of years later, he marries Mrs. Bentham's daughter. Um, and uh, if I remember like, rightly, they married on, in July 1893, and their first son was born in February 1988. So you can imagine the reason for the mad thing. Um, she unfortunately died having her second child in childbirth. Um, Could we just move it on? This might be slightly older, but this is about just the German. This was Alan Hall's book, The Story of Bradford. The city had the means of war production and the Germans who came here had the know-how how to sell the product around the world. So what the Germans kind of brought and what he'd been taught was the people that around here were brilliant at making a world-class superb cloth. But, but there was still kind of more of a system of it, you know, taking it down the peace hall and selling it. And the Germans came and said, look, oh, you've got to give credit. You've got to make personal relationships with people. If you go out and give people credit, to buy your cloth. When they've made their suits or whatever they do with it, they will pay you back and make another order. So they built that kind of business methodology that was just as important as the quality of the cloth in the rise of Bradford to becoming the wool, the wool capital of the world. And then exactly in 1901, there were 36 wool merchants in Bradford, of whom 23 were German. Um, can you just Moved on. Yeah, so Robert Kretzmar's uh, dad came from that water mill in a little village called Pratschutz over near the Czech border. Um, his mum came from Dolbeln, which is a very chocolate boxy German village there. And he was born on the third floor of that block of flats in Leipzig, which behind it is a school, and his father was a, was a teacher of, a, 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 of the school. And he had a brother and a sister. His brother died young, he was a Lutheran minister, and he died of TB. And his sister lived in that until she died in about 1840-something or other. She, 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 she remained a, a spinster. So, could you move on, Mike? So, I think it's pretty obvious, Mike. He, he, you know, he, he, he'd been trained in the world trade. He'd want to work the world trade. He came to Bradford. There were other Germans. There was a community. And this was the place to be if you were in the world trade. You know, you, you, the, the price of, the, of, of wool was set um, for the world here. And this was his company, Inman and Spencer. He became very rich. He lived out in uh, Berkshire, Gummersill, lived in Briar Hall, which was a Bronte building, I think. Um, and he lived uh, uh, eventually on um, Park Lane, off M Lane. He lived in Ross, Rossville, I think it was called. And my grandfather remembers being very grand, servants, coffee, billiard tables, all that kind of, kind of stuff. Um, he travelled extensively, he did trade delegations for the British Board of Trade, he spoke about seven languages, um, in his 80s he was learning Spanish so he could go to Argentina. Could you move on? 
Uh, he had 17 children. Uh, two, two by his first wife, Florence, who died. Um, one survived, the other one, the younger one, uh, died at the age of 17 uh, in Boston Harbor. He was an emergency seaman and he was pissed and he fell down the stairs and cracked his head. Um, which is sad, obviously. He then had another 15 children, five of whom died in infancy, and the other 10 survived. My granddad is the second one. Um, there was only one girl, Margaret, at the end. All the lads were kicked out of school at 14 and made to work in the crappiest jobs in the wool sector. And, and then they were sent abroad. My, my, my grandfather was sent to Canada for 10 years. One was sent to Argentina, another couple were sent to Canada. The girl was educated at Rodin, went to finishing school, was a debutante, all the rest of it. But the lads, consequently, most of the lads hated these gods. Yeah, and, and I have written, uh, I've got letters saying how appalling he was as a dad. Um, the only one who re never said a bad word about him was my granddad for some reason. He, he kept a very balanced view, he didn't really speak of him. Now, Norbert didn't change, well he changed from Wilhelm to William, but he didn't change Pollock, or he hadn't done at the time of his death. This guy did change his name in 1916, and he changed it to uh, Inman. Kretzmar is a Czech name, it means the same thing, an innkeeper, an Inman, so he changed it to Inman. Partly it could have been because of the war. Uh, uh, there was anti-German sentiment, nor but uh, the, the, the bits of red that he suffered up. But he was very prominent, and he was the chairman of a football club. And so, you know, he did get a lot of even though he was bankrolling um, the club. But uh, Mr. Kretzmar changed his name, I think also because his eldest son, John, had come of age and wanted to join the Coldstream Guards and fight the British Army. And if he was called John Kretzmar, he might have got a bit of ribbing in the showers. <laughs> so um, they changed his name to Inman. And John did go on, he, he joined the uh, uh, country guards, he was trained as a machine gunnery captain with a small team, and he went over to France in January 1918, and he fought at the Second Battle of the Somme. Um, he was gassed, he, he went to a field hospital where he was then shelled, and he had a big chunk taken out the side of his head. Uh, but he survived, he survived into old age. My mother remembers him quite well, but said he had this huge dent in his head, where this, this shell. So, We'll talk about this a bit about the kind of relationships with the Germans post and on and so on. But interesting that story of him um, joining up of the Kennedy line. Um, this is Fred Mawson. Fred came from a very poor family in there, but they lived in one of the back lanes and they were linen weavers on their own accounts, just living off what, what they could do. And he, like the others, came to Bradford to find his fortune. Lizzie comes from County Down. Um, actually comes from the same village as Michael's wife's grandparents in County Down. Um, and she was a laundress. She was a few years older than him. She was... Uh, for, uh, sorry, read it the wrong... Yeah, six years older than him. Uh, she was also a Roman Catholic. Uh, he converted to Catholicism so he could marry her. Um, and he, they met at the, I think it was the Victoria Hotel. He was a waiter, she was a lawn dresser. And he ended up being the head waiter at the Midland Hotel. That's where he ended up. And interestingly, Mr. Kretschmar, Robert, had his own table at the Midland. And it was set so he could see the door of the wool exchange. So if he was needed, his, his man would come out and wave if he was needed on the phone or whatever, and he would go, go across. So Fred, <laughs> contemporaries, Fred would have served Robert, his, his afternoon tea and his coffee and his breakfast and whatever he ordered. And their daughter married Robert Kretschmar's son, who became mine. And I wondered, well, I wonder if there was a bit of niggle about that. Now, one, is, one was a Catholic, one was a Protestant, and back then that was kind of quite important. But there was also a massive difference in social class between this very wealthy German wool trader and this waiter from Nairsburg. But apparently not. There was no animosity. The, the, everybody attended the wedding. Uh, good relations were kept afterwards. So um, quite interesting that sometimes these things don't end in the acrimony that you think that they're mine. 
Um, okay. <clears throat> right. Well, we can miss this one. I think I did that one. So, Norbert. A little bit about Norbert. So, um, that's Leo Pollock. I think I have a memory. I was three and a half when he died. But I think I have a memory of him. Or maybe it's just that I've seen these pictures so many times. But I did know his wife, Teresa, very well. And she lived in those flats on North Park Road over the over Park Court, looking over. And Leo lived there all their married life, they lived there. Leo didn't work. He obviously had, he had a private income from his dad. He wasn't rich, rich, but he didn't have to work. He had enough to live by reasonably comfortably. Um, so, and, and Norbert, obviously, you, you know, more, know more about Norbert than I do, but he died in 1916. Um, he, he was bankrolling the club. Um, the Germans had been apparently quite in, at the beginning of Bradford City, be quite an important factor in the creation of the club. And in uh, in room at the top, that uh, is it Ian Hemmers and John Dewhurst wrote that um, he, he was high profile, but he was also renowned as being somebody, no, but this is, uh, 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 who was a bit of an anxious, and he was very anxious apparently at the time of his death, um, that they might be interned or um, you know, might, might could come to, to some difficult trouble. And it's interesting because about, roughly about, I think, half the Germans left Bradford in the First World War and, and went back, but half stayed. And of course, many of them were naturalised. Uh, they changed their names and they were important. And, and from what I've read, the actual backlash against Germans in Bradford, although it did exist, was actually quite a lot less than it was in other cities. And partly because they, they had become a genuine part of the fa fabric and the wealth of, of the city. And I've got his death certificate. Um, so he's 48 years old. He died on the 29th of October 1916. And the cause of death was pernicious anemia, one year and three months, and cerebral hemorrhage. Five hours, and I'm sure uh, the war uh, finances his pernicious anemia, which is apparently a pretty miserable and untreatable thing at the time, would have made it quite difficult. And I think the other thing to kind of bear in mind that kind of struck me was that only a couple of months before his death, on the first of July, 1916, the Bradford Pals had gone over the top of the Battle of the Somme. And I, I, we're more experts than me, but I think there was something like 2,000 men in action that day, and within hours, half of them were dead or wounded. And that must have been an absolute massive blow to the city, um, and would probably have caused quite a lot of an emotive reaction to, to Germans living in the city as well, and the place would have been very, very raw. Um, could we have a next one? Um, I've heard it mentioned that he may have taken his own life. Um, the only thing I can say, that's his gravestone at Schoolmore, which is next to our family gravestone because he was married to a Fatterini and, and Pollocks and what have you. And that's his mass card. Um, and both of them say that he died fortified within the rites of the Holy Church. Now in those days, 1916, suicide in the Catholic Church was seen as a sin. So. It would have been a bit unusual if he had committed suicide, that he would have had a full funeral and a proper burial in a Catholic part of the ceremony at the school mark. Unless, of course, they... Grease the palm. They greased a palm or two, or got the doctor to write something else on the certificate. You know, I mean, who knows? Who, who, who is to know? But he did get buried in the full rites of the church. Now then, I've got something quite interesting that I know very little about, but you might. This thing. So, this came from uh, Leo Pollock. This was in his, because they had, Leo and Teresa had no kids. Uh, my mum got a lot of their stuff photographed and what have you, and, and, and this thing. And this thing, on this side of it, uh, are uh, pictures of what I believe to be the Bradford City team that won the FA Cup in 1911. Um, and their names, and then at the bottom, 
there's a scene from a match, which I don't think is final, because it says, um, div Divine scoring the second goal. And of course, there was no second goal in the FA Cup by then. So it may have been a, a, a semi-final or a quarter-final, um, but that is the picture of. Um, written on it in pencil, which you won't be able to see from there, it says, you, you, each of the players have got their nationality underneath, so Scotch, English, Irish, and it said, you will see by the above that they are all Bradford chaps, but they can play football. <laughs> um, and then if we look at the other side of it, it's even stranger. So round the sides are, are, are the colours of football teams, Norwich City, Newcastle United, Hull City, etc. And then in the middle is this weird, I've brought it, you can have a look at it, a weird thing. So that bit that I showed you first, there's the shining cup that was on the, the and there's the two players. But there's somebody being executed by a firing squad. There's somebody getting a, a sword stuck through the back. And there's a plane crash. There's a tank. There's some, some um, I, I mean, I, I just, I, there's two, two guys having a sword battle there. And it's signed by a guy called B. Simpson, and it's dated 1911. It's not passing around. No, you're passing around. Okay. Well, look at it. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know if that's a kind of a, I was thinking that the, the only war going on at the time was all oh, just finished with the Boer War. And is that kind of a Boer War scene? What's going on? Um, I, it, it is, there's airships, zeppelins. It's very, very. Uh, bizarre thing. I don't know who B. Simpson is. I don't know if he's or she is somebody who is known around. I don't know. Um, but uh, by all means, um, have a look. Um, and the last one, I've got another slide, is that it? No, that's it. Um, one bit I was going to say, is after, after the war, obviously, Mr. Kretschmar stayed here and went on to so in 1933, he was elected for the second or third time as the president of the Export Merchants Association. And there's a, an article about him here. Uh, and he was big in politics. He, was, he, he founded the Spen Valley Conservative Association. He um, was chair of Birkinshaw Council or something like that when he, lived, when he, when he lived out there. And he did trade missions. Um, and he was obviously well respected. This is 1933, you know, less than 10 years after the war, just over 10 years after the war. Obviously totally rehabilitated into the national fabric of, of, um, of Bradford. Um, as I suppose quite a lot of the Germans were. And then they had to go through it all again only another, you know, seven or eight years later. And I don't quite know his experience with the Second World War. My grandfather, his son, who was always an inmate, I mean, he was only a correct man for a few years of his life before they changed their name. But my mother said that he was interviewed at the beginning of the war by the police because neighbours said that he was shining the light out the attic roof, you know, to find the Germans in. So it was still kind of going on there. And you couldn't get anybody more British than my granddad, you know, I mean, he was... So, yeah. Um, so that's it. Um, pardon? You haven't mentioned the Fatterini connection. What, the Fatterini The Fatterini connection? I thought everybody will get the factory connection. So, sorry? Yes. Um, uh, Norbert was married to Marie Fatterini, who was from the Italian jewellers Fatterini family. And it was them that made the FA Cup. Um, so, and just amazingly, the first year that that new FA Cup was played, contested for, was 1911. And the first team to win it was Bradford, uh, of the city in which the Cup was made. So, I thought that was sort of pretty. No, no. So, no, no. So that, that, that's a, a, an interesting uh, thing about the the, the Fatterini FA Cup. I think it was retired. That particular one was retired um, about two thousand or something like that. And there's a new one since. Um, but it's on display in some football museum somewhere. Well, thanks very much. You've been an absolutely lovely audience. Um, I hope that's been enjoyable. Ask me any questions. Please come and have a look at the bits and trinkets if you wish. And um, thanks very much. Cheers.
It's quite instructive that nobody, nobody flinched when the gun running was mentioned, nobody flinched when the IRA was mentioned, nobody flinched when the Germans were mentioned, but when he mentioned the Conservative Party, <laughs> He was like, ooh. The swine. He moved to Leeds as well, didn't he? He didn't move to Leeds. He moved from Leeds. He moved from Leeds, that's okay, that's fine. But thank you, John. It was really fascinating to go back through a bit of Bradford's history. It just really shows us how a strange city it is, and a wonderful city. The fact that the, the William Pollock was the chairman of Bradford City, and he was married to a Paterini, and we won the FA Cup in the first team. It's all very suspicious, isn't it? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was one of merit. Definitely one of merit. Anyway, thank you. And um, this is our last one of the season, of course, so just a big thanks to everybody who was our speakers. Thanks to Keith and the gang for putting up with us all year. All of you. Including moving images across the first time. We'll be back next year at some point, probably from October on, we'll be always waiting for the uh, warm weather. And of course, a big thank to Joe, who's been filming us, and it'll be all on YouTube. Thank you, John. Thank you, Joe. Keep on the back of your head, Joe. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, guys.